uh, rush through a lot of it. It's not designed to talk to every slide. You'll get really, really bored and tired of the whole thing if I do that. So I've got the PDF export of this, which I'll provide after. There's a link at the end. Yeah, I'll send it to you. There will be errors. So yeah, submit a pull request, tell me what's up. So the obligatory, who am I slide? So yeah, been on tech for ages, done my, done my time. It's like tech, engineer, lead, whatever we want to call ourselves this month, whether it's platform or operations or DevOps or whatever, I don't know, AI engineer, no. But yeah, started working with AI related things, or as we're calling it these days in early 2020 with a few sort of custom code completion tools and things, mostly IDE integration, and then moved on to the GitHub Copilot private beta in early 2021. Uh, that then went into, I think public beta was like mid or late 2021, could be wrong. And yeah, got a lot of value out of it really quickly. I was quite kind of surprised. And then I got really crazed, like full on bit by the vampire sort of thing with AI and LLMs in sort of late 2022, early 2023. Yeah, you can read the rest there. I am absolutely not an AI expert or ML engineer, data engineer. I'm definitely not. I know nothing about data. What even is data? I'm not even a programmer by trade platform engineer. So uh, yeah, and clearly I'm not a comedian based on my jokes. Um, <clears throat> so this is what sort of spurred this off this last year. I've um, played with a lot of tools. These are just the ones I can remember. And I know for a fact, there's a lot more than this. Um, so I was, you know, I'm, I'm always talking about them, whether it's in the SIG Gen AI or with friends or a couple of other external groups and they're like, oh man, you should give them a bit of a ranking and tell us which ones are the good ones. And it's, it's totally overloaded. So I did come up with this kind of ugly <laughs> interactive table of how I rate things as I play with them. That's up on my crappy blog. Feel free to have a look at that. There's a link afterwards as well. I'm going to try and keep it up to date. I know people say that about things, but I might try. Um, it's kind of good thought exercise to get those things out. So I'm going to start with the question. AI, is it underhyped or overhyped? I think it's both. Uh, I, I heard the little sound that someone made a comment and I'm sure people say it's over. I think it's both. Um, and the reason I think it's both is because I think products are massively overhyped, like really overhyped. We've all seen these things around. The latest one that cracked me up was that Lassian one, do the impossible with Atlassian intelligence. And it's like, dude, you can't even get your search working. You know, like, how are you going to do like AI? Um, you know, and all the bloody chatbots. It's just tiring seeing all this stuff. And, you know, yeah. So I think the product side of things uh, is definitely overhyped. But I genuinely think the technological and social implications are underhyped. Um, I think we're facing potentially the biggest shake up to the global workforce since the industrial revolution. I really do think that. And doubt is rampant. So, you know, we've all heard of these things, you know, isn't another hype cycle like cryptocurrency. What if it introduces bad code? What even is bad code? You know who writes bad code? Developers write bad code. Your power bill must be high was, uh, is what I get all the time. <laughs> I don't want to send all my data to vendor, whether it's open AI, Anthropic, whoever. And why would I care about local AI when there's chat GPT or whatever, insert product there. But saying all that and being aware of all that doubt, I get genuine value out of using AI or LLMs every single day. And I have done for years now. And it's not always an easy one to explain to people how you're getting value, because I guess the way you use it is a little bit meta and it's very dependent on the situation. And because there's lots of trial and error, you can't say, oh, just do this and you will get this output. So this deck sort of aims to show some of the ways that I use AI or LLMs to augment my capabilities. So yeah, what I use AI LLMs for, prompting tips, I promise you I'm not gonna go into 
crazy detail in that. It's a very dry subject and everyone thinks they're a prompt engineer, which is totally not a thing. My code gen workflow, uh, and you'll note that quite a few of the slides or the content within this is sort of a little bit focused on code gen, and that's because I, that's what I use AI LLMs for 80, 90% of the time. Picking the right models, model formats, context windows, what even are they? Quantization at a high level, model servers, inference parameters, again, just a touch on that because everyone's got a hot take, clients and tooling, and just a really simple getting started cheat sheet. If you're like, oh, I want to play with stuff, but there's too many options or whatever. So yeah, what I'm not covering today. So why use local LLMs? Stepping back for a second, sorry to give you a bit of a jar there. Um, so for me, this is just in the context of me, it's a bit like saying, why would I wear my own clothes? Well, you can just rent costumes every day. It's like, yeah, maybe. Um, it's not just another bill and we've all got some subscription fatigue, but it's a, it's a bill in US dollars and any, <laughs> lots of people on here will feel that pain. Being in Australia, obviously the AUD to USD has been incredibly weak for way too long. I don't really want to keep funneling all my income to the 1% in Silicon Valley. Yeah, it just seems weird, weird way to spend your money. Privacy and security, agency, a lot of that is around being able to customize and experiment and kind of own your ideas. There's a little part of me, not, I'm not a prepper, I swear, that has like a disaster planning mindset. We've just been through a global pandemic. What if something else like that does happen again or worse? Back in New Zealand, you know, went through a massive earthquake in Christchurch. We had weeks without power and water and stuff like that. What if I still want to be able to work or do, do things that I otherwise would be a lot slower at doing? Performance, latency and throughput's a big one there for Australian internet, that can be a real pain. And supporting the concept of open source and open weights, we really don't want to promote another Internet Explorer style global tech ecosystem. That was a nightmare. I really don't want to go back to it. We've already got NVIDIA as, you know, the most wealthy company in the world now, and we've got a monoculture there. We've got a, not a monoculture so much with OpenAI, but they're trying to make it one. Regulatory capture and all this other horrible stuff. And of course, learning, education, and fun. So, what do I actually use? IDE integration, chat interfaces, OS integration, home automation, article summarization a little bit, document querying, web search, augmentation, peer review a lot, reviewing and rewriting text, and PKI, which is like personal knowledge base, and like your obsidian or your bear or whatever augmentation and I do quite a bit of uh, thought experience where I sort of think I understand something but want to be challenged and sort of might word up uh, scenarios with AI to I guess challenge my assumptions or challenge my knowledge and um, I find that quite useful for learning and of course I generate art big scare quotes on that one <laughs> t-shirts wallpapers logos making sick memes and of course swapping my face onto the entire cast of full house how i use ai's lms now this is the short bit on prompting my number one prompting tip this is this is we're starting with the soft stuff is treat every chat interaction as if it was the first time you're meeting someone that knows nothing about you the reason for this is the context matters I tell this to my girlfriend, I tell it to my friends, my co-workers, I tell it to myself because I've got to remember to do that. Spending a little bit of extra time early on with your prompts to give it a bit of context pays off dividends in the medium term. Just imagine walking into a room and it's full of people you don't know. You walk up to one of them and you go, hey, can you write me a GitHub Actions workflow that deploys to ECS and logs to whatever? And they don't know what language you're talking in. They don't, you know, they don't know anything about you. They don't know what your expected outputs are. They don't, they, they don't have the context to make a good decision. So what is the objective and why are we doing this? Up here in blue, outlining that. What are the constraints? What is the expected output? So whether that's like a JSON thing or a markdown file or whatever. Can you provide an example? Not always possible, but if you can, that helps the model predict or sort of influences its next predictions to be more in line with what you've provided it. 
who's the intended audience? Like, are we building an open source project? Is it just for me? I'm happy on it at home, tone, all that sort of thing. And then really important, iterate. You know, we do it in engineering all the time. You can't always expect that a single prompt is gonna get you where you want to go. So that's just me trying to get it out of my head of what I tend to do that gives me good prompts. I've tried to sort of sketch this out. You can have a look at it offline. So I sort of break it down into, I think like what makes a good prompt for me, for code gen at least. I sometimes get asked about system prompts and it, it seems to really depend on the kind of model you're using. Before any code, list a few key bullet points, two to five items at most, concisely stating in three to six words the steps you'll take, then carry out the request in full. Sometimes I use a system prompt like that with some code gen models and I get far greater responses. And others, it just seems to make it more verbose. So it's a bit hit and miss, but there's a visual representation of, I guess, what my sort of prompt format looks like. In the context of code generation, as I said before, an IDE, so tab complete 2.0, that's probably the most common thing that people are using with GitHub Copilot or continue.dev or whatever. Quite often I'll select a function and then ask it to refactor it because my code is backed. <laughs> I'll generate code from comments and that might be like a JS doc block, for example, where I start out the doc and I might define the inputs and outputs and parameters and then get it to generate the code afterwards. That method is really effective, really, really impressive. And sometimes it's a single prompt, sometimes it's multiple prompts. And sometimes I use frameworks like mixture of agents and things like that as well. A really surprising one to me was that I'm actually find a chat style interface or app far more useful than I thought I would for coding. I would have thought that the deep IDE integration or tools like if you've ever heard of Ada or anything like that, that are sort of more techy and codey would be far more valuable. But actually quite often I find myself using a web interface or a client application and uh, ingesting my entire code base quite often if I can, and then having that in context and working with it in close to natural language to be really valuable. So on that JS doc block example, this is what it looks like. Ignore the, the, what the code's actually for, but basically quite often I'll find myself defining what I want a function to do like this. And once you define a few, it can almost think about, that can almost predict what the next function you're gonna define is. And that uh, creates fantastic, quite often really, really good completion hints you know, and it can be complete as long as you've got your dot block correct. You can even tab down in the parameters and it might suggest additional parameters that you haven't thought about. And in the idea, I, I do use a combination of Copilot since day one, since day negative one, I guess, and also continue.dev or continue, as it's I think now called, and that's with local LLM models. It supports remote ones as well. The Quality varies greatly in both, I think, as lots of you will know. I do actually tend to get higher quality responses out of continue. I think mainly because the models that you can run locally, if you've got the hardware or the setup to run them, are a lot larger than what Copilot sort of allocates to an individual user. The other problem I've had with Copilot a lot is being rate limited. Some might call that being productive, <laughs> I don't know, but I find myself getting rate limited, you know, it'd be like two o'clock and I'll just be wanting to finish that last 10% and then it just sits there and it doesn't tell you what's going on. It just stops working and you have a look at your rate limits in the GitHub API or whatever and you find you're over it. Fantastic. Just got to wait. Nothing you can do. You can't even spend a dollar to get more or whatever. This is funny on that last screenshot. This is Copilot. And this was a genuine suggestion to a very stupid question, might I ask, but yeah, classic. Yeah, my one slide animation. <laughs> Code ingestion. So this is a, a really simple tool that I use every day, all the time. It's called Code to Prompt. You've got to be careful, there's two, of, two apps with exactly the same name and spelling on GitHub. One of them, some TypeScript project thing. The other one's written in Rust, so it must be cool, right? But it is really fantastic, really simple, single binary. And what it does is if you're in a code repo or a directory or whatever, 
you run it and you pass it in some parameters if you want to or a template or some filters and it basically gets all the matching files or all the files that are included and it puts each file the contents of each file as is without modifying it inside a code block and then it combines them all together each file with its full path in your working directory uh, working tree i should say and then it puts it into a single markdown file and by default it copies it to your clipboard that can be changed but that's really really useful especially when it combines it with estimating how many tokens that is so you can see here i've grabbed an app that i wrote i just ran my set of defaults it's gone and it's grabbed all the relevant code from that repo along with the file tree and information and it's estimated how many tokens it's twenty-eight thousand tokens roughly that's based on uh, an open ai model but that's fine and then it automatically copies it to the clipboard um takes like half a second or less to do all that which is really cool so i guess rust is cool um and how i use that in my workflow i've kind of basically i i, I copy it to my code base quite often i'll open a chat style interface mainly open web ui which i'll go into in a bit but think of it like chat gpt but you run it yourself and i select the model i want whatever parameters i want and quite often i'll preface it with something like this is my application and dump that whole context of like almost thirty thousand tokens in and then your task is make it not shit or whatever it's going to be <laughs> and let it rip and it works really well like i've written whole applications like this like iteratively and they're not that bad <laughs> and yeah you'd, you'd be surprised how well that works and i think this is the main reason that i found chat interfaces quite useful is that you don't you spend less time messing around with oh i'll use this agent in this framework and i'll pipe this here it's like no man just copy my code base dump it to the llm get a response like it's simple it does work it's not perfect parts of it could be automated i love for this to be part of my ide in a more effective way so when we talk about clients i mentioned open web ui i really really like this project it's it's nice this is a screenshot of my instance doing some uh absolute oh, it is real it's real code in there yeah okay so web interface you can run it locally host it in a docker container it gets a lot of development updates every day it's got some uh, nice features like tooling and chaining and scripting built in you can call python scripts from your models that have tooling calling or function calling multimodal it's got lots of options lots of, everyone that likes widgets and dials and buttons there's lots of them you can press a cool thing which i haven't used but it, it, which is kind of sets it quite differently is it's got i, I believe pretty robust multi-user idp rbac and admin controls over it so theoretically if you're in a team you could sort of deploy this and use it internally open source and license and i think it's apache too from memory yeah really really good project uh, i definitely rate it very fast and it has some cool features like you know your little thumbs up thumbs down you get on chat gpt and stuff and you always go does this actually do anything how much my data is it sending to them whenever i say that whatever it is their recipe for tomato soup sucks what you can do because you're running this yourself when you press the thumbs up and thumbs down it stores that if you wanted to and you can extract that as a json export and then you can feed that in if you're doing fine tuning if you're creating a LoRa or an adapter for a model or if you're doing i don't know data set creation or whatever so you, as you say things are good or bad you can embed that in your models going forward i mentioned about its tooling it's pretty cool you can they've got like a public almost like a github actions marketplace style tooling a website where you can kind of go yes i trust this remote code i'm just going to execute it as root obviously not but there's quite a good library there it's only got released a couple of weeks ago and it's already starting to fill up which is quite impressive they've got things like mixture of agents built in some people have started to create workflows for basically you can write a python script you can integrate it with your ai through here sorry for the hideous dark screenshots that was just what their website would give me at the time and they've got like a little library you can go and try out different tools 
And yes, it can run Doom. So you can run Doom with your AI. So you tell your AI, hey, I want to run Doom. And it will go, oh, I know what that tool is. And it will download the shareware, whatever, mods and launch it up in your browser inside JavaScript. That is crazy. Another one I use, Big AGI. Hardly anyone talks about this one, but it is really good for, for a few different reasons. Similar to OpenWebUI, I'm not going to go over the same sort of features again. It is particularly good for code gen. And the reason for that is this feature, the selling feature is a thing called Beam, which basically allows you to use multiple models together to get responses. So like mixture of agents or mixture of experts to a certain degree, but a little bit, kind of a little bit smarter because they don't have to be of the same family. They don't even have to be with the same API provider. You can use a tiny lightweight model for the first um, instance. Then you might have a model that's really good at JSON or a really good documentation model. And what you can do is neat stuff. So this is a bit hard to fit onto a slide and I couldn't really get it on here great, but I highly recommend you go and check out their website. You can basically take the output of a model and then you can set another model as sort of like a control model. And as I said, you might have three or four or five or 20 different models, all specialists or working on different parts of your code. You'll have them all as like vertical columns like this. And you can use one, say, really smart model, come and judge their responses. And you don't just pick the best one, but I mean, you can, but you can combine them all using the smartest or more expensive model into one high quality output. And what's really neat about that is they've got some smarts around it where you can actually do it, what they call a guided response, which is where it chunks up the solution or the response into, uh, into sections. And it gives you a tick box option for each section. You go, oh, I like this model's read me, I like this model's API spec, I like this model's error handling. And you click the button, you go confirm selection, and it will actually merge them all into one response. And that is super cool. And it's far more reliable than I expected. Highly recommend checking that out. Then there's a couple of desktop clients that I use. One of them is Vault. It is a paid product. It's just one solo dev. He's a really nice dude. And he's very quick at implementing my uh, feature requests, which is, is nice. It's a sort of, it's a Mac OS native app, so it's quite fast and you can, you have got nice like keyboard bindings, so you can kind of press a button and just, it will take anything from a clipboard if you allow it or your selection, which kind of, kind of AI enables, God, I hate saying that, any app that you can run really, multiple different backend providers, Olama, OpenAPI, Anthropic, you name it, it's really good. Anything LLM is another popular one. It's uh, very capable with RAG and tooling. So off the shelf, it's got nice stuff like connectors for Confluence, YouTube, GitHub, where you just put in your token, if it's a private, whatever it is, repo, Confluence, and it will connect. And then you can index and perform queries across your data. Like, And it, it's really quite good. The main downside to it, and the thing that stops me using it more often, is just because it's so damn ugly. It's, it's hideous. I find that yeah, quite repulsive. But it is quite capable and it's a really easy to use tool. So if you're sort of like, oh, where do I get started? You can download this. You can, it can have its own model server built in or you can connect it to external model servers, APIs. It's got its own uh, like Chroma DB and the document database is built in. It's pretty lightweight when it runs and you can even run it as a client server sort of, or a server model server side and just render it up in the browser with RBAC and um, multi-user and all that sort of stuff. Um, another one that's really, really, really pretty, I just love the, the interface on this one, is Misty. Um, it's, uh, yeah, very pleasing. You can sort of split conversations, really good one for new starters. It's not open source, but it's got quite a good concept of a document library. So you can create sort of knowledge stacks, I think they call it, and you might have like your API documentation, and that might consist of a multiple different markdown files and a, maybe an API spec or something like that. Then you might have your reference API designs or something like that. And then in any conversation, you can just sort of add my reference information and, and pull that into context, which is quite nice. LM Studio, lots of people know this one. It's, it uses Llama CPP under the bonnet, like a lot of tools. It's got a pretty good interface. Doesn't have all the settings I like it to have, but it, it's quite limited. 
in the early days, like a year or so ago, whenever it was becoming popular, I was recommending it quite a bit just because it was easy for people to get started on. One thing it does have in it that's really, really nice is a good uh, model browser for downloading models. So it'll connect to Hugging Face, it'll show you what your machine can and can't run based on your RAM or VRAM, um, and it's cross-platform, um, which is kind of nice. I'm not gonna go into any more detail on this one slide, but for image generation, because I've already done a talk on that, I just highly recommend Invoke AI. It's, it really is a fantastic tool. Think of it a bit like Photoshop, but for AI in that it's got the sort of values workflow and I guess like through the artist life cycle, if you will, and whether that's just making a logo for your little tool on GitHub or whether you're, I don't know, face swapping out the ex-husband or wife or whatever from family photos. It, it really is very good. It's got layering, model downloading. Yeah, fantastic. Highly recommend it. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to go through a few things that people often ask me. The next one would be choosing the right models. It's a very common sort of thing. Like, how do you pick which one, it, which one to use next? So I'd start by sort of knowing your task. You know, you're doing coding, general reasoning, logic, tool use, multimodal, whatever. IoT, another one. It doesn't need to run on the edge. And then I, is your use case, and this is, it's not always this black and white, but is your use case favoring brains or brawn? Wise, slower, lean, but fast, great reasoning capabilities, or maybe just a good general model because it's a chatbot for a website or something. One thing I'll say on that before we dive into a bit more technical stuff is that models are improving quickly. You know, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by, you know, the 10 models that drop today and then 10 that'll drop tomorrow. But the, the, the rate of progress is really good and it actually genuinely is worth, I guess, relatively frequently questioning whether the model you're running and have, has picked is still working for you effectively or efficiently. You might say, well, what if, yeah, I'm using a model that's three months old, Llama two, three, whatever, right? It's working fine for me. Yeah, but you might re greatly reduce your CPU cycles. You might get lower latency and probably higher, almost always higher quality responses out of something that dropped, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So it's definitely worth um, sort of going, oh yeah, I have been using this a while. Do I need to swap it out? And it's usually very easy to swap out, at least the, on the open model side of things. Um, so the other, I guess the other part of that is the open models are closing the gap. There's nothing that's going to come close to, really close to like say, Claude Sonnet 3.5. That's a, that's a really good, that's by far the best, I think, proprietary paid model out there. But they are catching up. I was sort of trying to graph, I was getting my head around a few things and I was trying to graph out some stats on model performance and benchmarks are just benchmarks. It's just one lens and all that sort of thing. But it's interesting to see some of the graphs at the rate of change over time and how quickly open source models have really caught up, particularly in the last six months. So talking about benchmarks and things. <laughs> yeah, so I really honestly, Benchmarks do not tell the whole story. Benchmarks can lie. Benchmarks can deceive. They can tell the truth that the company wants to tell. They can omit things, which is a really big one. However, if you use them as a data, a data point or a starting point for which model should I run this week, they can be really, really useful. And here I've added a bunch of links that you can take a look at afterwards and just a little, I know it's a pie chart, but whatever, of, of the various benchmarks that you might see floating around and that can kind of give you a rough idea of the areas where a model might be stronger or weaker. Some of the benchmark dashboards have got an interesting sort of thing going on that's been criticized quite heavily, uh, which is where some of the, some of the leaderboards will rank model responses with AI, which, okay, whatever, but they'll rank it only with like a single AI and it's usually GPT-4, GPT-4.0. And that's had a sort of a, an effect or a couple of different effects. One of them is that it's biased towards models that are also trained on GPT-4 synthetic data. 
models from those companies, obviously, but also it's kind of, it's created a monoculture within where people are competing for benchmarks and to compete for those benchmarks, they want to use the data from the one source and that's not good for anything. So just be aware of that. But I think these are my favorite ones, you know, uh, obviously cost considerations. One thing, this is a busy slide, but one thing there is that just because a model, I guess, is smarter or an API is smarter, doesn't make it it cost effective. You know, some interesting research was done by this uh, company on the right that I've got that sort of with all the silly emojis from. It's just a, a screenshot, and they found how hideously expensive OpenAI's GPT four and Claude three and Google's Gemini and all the stuff was hideously expensive. So that's cost per million tokens on the right side. And the Y axis is the score as to how good is it in a, they've got the open source data set of coding tasks. And they really found that some models that maybe don't have the biggest marketing departments in the world, shall we say, but that are quite affordable, return really good quality results for much, much cheaper. So if you are going with private API based models, consider your cost uh, per token and don't just go, oh, oh, we, this, we can't afford GPT-4, we'll go GPT-3.5. So, well, maybe you could get the same quality just from a different provider. Use a standard library that supports multiple different backends, provide at the new endpoint, pay your money, and use the other model. All right, now so let's get a little bit more technical. And this is where I think I probably have the, the, the way I've kind of, I guess, got this data is this is an explosion from what's in my brain. It's bound to be wrong in places. So if you know more about any one area than I do, which most of you probably do, please correct me after the talk, send me a link, pull request accepted, et cetera. But there's a few things that go into finding the right model. Once you think you know what you want, the things to consider like the model parameter size seems to be a bit opaque to people. So they know that, you know, say Llama, I don't know, 70B is, must be bigger than Llama 8B, but what does that actually mean? And what even are parameters? I was trying to come up with an analogy that would make sense to people as far as I understand them. So in a neural network, top left hand corner, there's that little circular sort of diagram thing I sketched up quickly yesterday. There's weights and there's I guess, uh, and each parameter has a set of weights, they link to each other. And if you think about like a recipe book, so if our recipe book is, it's a recipe to generate text and you've got all your ingredients in there. So each ingredient, but also the amount of ingredient that will contain a parameter, which is, you know, the weight in the neural network. So the more of those that you have, Technically, the not the smarter, but maybe the larger the brain is, you can think of the brain sizes in the, in the model. Garbage in, garbage out, like with everything. You can have a model that's got tons of information, but it's not well curated, it's not well engineered. You look at that um, XAI's Brock with a K, not Q model, and it's just like 200 billion parameters and it's pretty garbage. And you have a look at some of the small, you know, 14B models or something like that, that are really stunning, like really, really impressive. So, you know, the quality of the data sets and the curation and the engineering that's gone into it really do, I guess, like have a large impact on the output. But you can generally think of larger parameters, parameter models tend to have like better reasoning, better understanding or like grasping nuance and conversation, often slightly better in multilingual situations. And they tend to stay on track a little bit better, although some modern techniques have um, helped kind of like focus conversations. And they tend to be way better at creativity. Obviously, each model you can get domain experts in. So you might have a model that's really good at coding, but completely garbage at other things. And that's because its parameters, even if it's a, say, an 8 billion parameter model, its parameters are very condensed. Uh, it's a very dense model. Um, and the other thing that ties in to parameters is context size. And this is only recently become really talked about, I guess, monks, general AI enthusiasts slash cowboys like me, but it mass, it really, really does matter. So think of context size. If you don't know what it is, 
like the working memory that a model has. So if you were to apply it to yourself, you're looking at a code base that you wrote a year ago. Um, let's just say you read through the whole thing again. How much of that horizontal knowledge can you recall accurately? That's key, accurately, before you have to go back and look at the code again and maybe forget some of the other information you just read. There's been, I guess, quite a few models that have been put out by companies that, shall we say, have a vested interest in you upgrading to a paid model that have tiny context windows, really small, like under 16K, you know, a lot of them are like 8K, some of them 4K. And while that might be okay for certain tasks, let's say it's a model that's very specific, it's running on your phone or whatever to, I don't know, tag images or whatever you're doing on your phone, that's fine. But as soon as you want to use it for coding, which is what I mainly do, it's damn near useless if it's got an under 16k usable token limit. Something with token limits as well is that you get some some groups when they make models, they'll say that a model has say an 8k to uh, context window. And you might be like, yeah, it's not very good, but I'll use it anyway. But some of them you got to look into the details because they'll have sliding window attention, which or different types of uh, attention that can basically roll off the oldest amount of information and they will claim that a model can do 8k but in reality once you get to about 4k the, as the quality starts to degrade it will actually start forgetting quite quickly the oldest knowledge you'll only have about a 4k window of perfect recall <clears throat> and the most recent one with that is like Gemma too from Google 8k context window and people are like that's tiny what what is that useful for in the, in code land not much but even worse than that have 4k sliding window so that thing's going to be lobotomized at the end of every conversation again not always but if you're loading in quite a bit of data it's a really big problem common one is how do i find the context size and this is way harder than it should be. I just wish everyone would publish it in their model release, readme, markdown, or whatever. Thankfully, there's a few different places you can find it, but it takes a little bit of hunting and picking it sometimes. So some nice models, as I said, in the readme, will just say context length. And that's it, cool, parameter size, you know, sorry, not parameter size, context size. Otherwise, if you're looking at quantized models, which we'll get to very, very shortly, you can, look at the GGUF, which is a, a quantization format or a model format on Hugging Face, open up its information tab and you'll see as I've highlighted there, context length. In this case, it's 32K, which is reasonable for a mid-size model. There's a couple of different places you can find it. The one thing I'd call out is that Olama, while great, they've got some really weird defaults. By default, if you create an Olama model and the official models are created like this, they only have a 2K context limit set just in the model config. So you might load up a model like Queen 2 there, which has 32K, expecting it to work like the benchmarks say and go, oh, that's, that's not right. And it's because by default, it's just loading in with that 2K context. And you might need to change that in the inference parameters. It's really easy to do, but yeah, it's something you gotta be aware of, which is exactly why you can't rely on Olama show to show you the real context length it's just showing you the configured context length. Pretty much all libraries allow you to set that at time of inference and model servers tend to let you set that when loading a model as well. I won't go into this in too much detail, but model formats for local LLMs, the two big ones are GGUF and EXL2, which is XLAMA V2. GGUF by far the most common, easily the most common model ever. You'll see it everywhere. That's a format used by Llama CPP, which is a model server. It used to be known as GGML, which is actually the underlying format, but you'll see that everywhere. So all those tools I was talking about before, they all load GGML files or GGUF files. And you can find one hug and face just by searching GGUF, the name of the model you're interested in. XL2 is a bit different. That's for Xlama V2, which is a different type of model server. They're not intercompatible with each other. Similar sort of things like context windows and uh, quantization, which we'll get to apply, but yet it's a different model format. They're not going to work on the same thing. XL2, for example, only works on GPUs. 
So while it's quite fast, or it's actually faster than GGUF, it is not going to run on your local MacBook. GGUF is awesome. It kind of runs CPUs, GPUs, phones, you know, probably it will run on a Raspberry Pi, you name it. And then it will scale up pretty well, pretty well. And there's a bunch of other model formats you'll see out there, like AWQ, GPTQ, which is slowly dying off. HQQ, which I know nothing about, but came across the other day. And unquantized model formats, sometimes just safe tenses or hugging face format. Pretty cool. So I said quantization a couple of times. And I, to touch on that, I tried to sort of do a few analogies. So if we go back to that neural network, I've got a, a sort of a uh, couple of rough analogies here. So quantization, think of it a bit like compression or the output of it being compression. So all it's doing is, it's not all it's doing, it is one of the things it's doing is it's reducing the precision of the data types. So, you know, you might have a 16 or 32 bit floating point integer with lots of zeros or numbers on the end. And it's basically reducing that so that it takes up less space. So it costs less to compute, you know, uses less power, faster inference, all that sort of stuff. And in the process, you do lose some accuracy. Thankfully, it's not as simple as just lobotomizing it after a certain number. There's some really interesting algorithms that are well over my head as to how it rounds up, rounds down. And also in a model, there's multiple layers, a bit like in a Docker image. And some layers can get a preference to be a higher quant type. So, you know, you might have some layers that are doing full 16 bit floats. And the next layer to compensate for that might be just a two bit because it's sparse and doesn't contain much important information, just semantics maybe. I guess an analogy to look at there, and this is definitely a rough analogy, is if you think about your 16-bit colors back in, back in the day, this was more of a thing, and then your 8-bit, you're kind of getting the full end-to-end, -end, the breadth of the spectrum, but you're losing parts of the data throughout. So, yeah, the, the main thing is that saves you a lot of storage, saves you a lot of VRAM. Without it, people would not really be running models locally. <laughs> and with it, as I said, the negative side is a loss in quality. Um, quite often that's measured as perplexity, which is basically, I guess, the amount of responses, it's not the simple, the amount of responses that contain errors. So as a model is quantized more and more and more and more, the error, the, the rate of errors goes up and higher perplexity is bad, right? Ideally, when you can find a model or if you're ever measuring this, sort of acceptable below 0 0.05, but ideally 0 0.01 and lower. So we're dealing with very, very small numbers here. An interesting part of quantization and complexity and loss and things is that the larger the model parameter size, so let's say a 70 billion parameter model, the less affected, less affected by quantization it becomes. So a small 7 billion parameter model, let's say, it will be probably like a gibbering idiot if you heavily quantize it and it will not really be useful. Probably below Q4KM, which is a, we'll get to, but it's a middle, middle sort of middle of the road quants, your Toyota Camry of quants. It's, you know, that's a standard quant, it'll work fine, it's not perfect. Below that, you really start to notice drop off in quality and the model will repeat itself, won't stay on task, and it's like a lobotomy. And with larger models though, I think you've got so much more data there, you've got a bit more you can throw away and it becomes less of, a, a, less of a major issue. So a really large model, you can actually run heavily quantized right up on the right-hand side of that graph and it could be very useful. Sort of. I guess given a little bit of a graph here, I tried to whip up yesterday um, that shows the, the rate of loss per, uh, per model parameter size um, at each quant type. That's definitely an offline slide. And it, it's a confusing thing to explain, but it's not complex from a user perspective at all. Like it's really simple. You're just like, oh, those ones are good. Those ones are bad. And a really important one is, can I actually fit this in my graphics card or my laptop or whatever? So I kind of came up with a bit of a cheat sheet yesterday. It's definitely not perfect and it's a bit biased in places probably, but 
I tried to just come up with a little heat map or a table of common GPU VRAM sizes or laptop RAM sizes that you can kind of pick from and go, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to, this model is 14 billion parameters and I've got 20 gigs of RAM. Okay, I can run it Q4K and probably you give it a go and there's a little flow for that as well. Another view on that is, I guess there's a performance aspect as well. The less quantized the model is, the, the closer to floating point it is, the slower it's going to perform. There's also a couple of different quantization types. And one of them, the most recent one actually, is not yet optimized for metal and CPU usage. So if you're going to use it on that, it's going to perform slowly. Another handy little table if you want to use that as a cheat sheet at some point. So I mentioned about like the small models versus the large models being impacted by quantization. The reason that sort of matters is you might go, well, I've got X amount of RAM or memory available to me. Do I pick and the little 8 billion parameter model in the same family as a 70 billion parameter model? And if I can, if I can run the 70 billion parameter heavily quantized or the 8 billion at near floating point in my VRAM space, there's, there's always a bit of a balancing game as to what you want to pick there. I've sort of highlighted there sort of the, the I guess the, the, the percentage higher the MML use, that's a benchmark response. The higher the better. The, what's really interesting here is you can see that the smaller 8 billion parameter model at Q6K, which is really pretty good quantization, is still quite a bit less intelligent on this benchmark than a 70 billion parameter model basically lobotomized at two or three bit of precision, which is really interesting. Now it's still going to be slower because it's got more parameters to, you know, compute and process and store and things. But it becomes interesting when you start looking at the larger models that you can go, actually, a slightly slower response at a heavy quant size can be worth the trade-off. Okay, tooling. Okay, Llama CPP, mentioned it before. Anyone that's played around with AI stuff has probably run it or has used a tool that runs it. Um, really rapid development, open source, works really well on Mac OS and Linux and probably that Windows thing if anyone still runs that. Um, it's heavily customizable, a large range of quantization options and works on CPU, GPU, and I think NPUs actually. I think it's got a couple of NPUs it supports. Yeah, it's not, it's not the fastest, but it's, it's really become quite performant particularly in the last like three months or so. Another tool that I'm calling a model server, but under the bonnet, it uses Llama CPP. At the moment, at the moment, only Llama CPP, but they are adding in more model servers soon. Uh, is Olama super, super popular? Just think of it as basically the Docker experience, but for LLM serving. And it, it actually, when you build a Olama model, it's literally just saving the GGUF into a layer in a OCI compliant container image. So it's adding it's just a Docker image. You have the model at the bottom layer, and then you'll have any parameters at the next layer, and then the prompt template at the next layer. So much so that you can actually push and pull Olama models to any Docker registry, which is kind of cool. So you can run your own private registry or internal business registry, and you know have all your usual container scanning and whatever going on there, and push your models to it. It what's really nice is the performance in the last three months has just really shot through the roof. Automatically handles concurrency, parallelization, load balancing of multiple models on a single host. And that screenshot there, I just took. It was I was running three different models: an embedding model, a small model, and a slightly larger model, all on one machine. And it was handling, you know, which model should it evict first, and have I got enough VRAM to actually load another model. And how much concurrency do I have to increase performance at the cost of more VRAM usage? Very cool. Xlama V2, I'm just going to touch this super quick. Really, really performant. Only works on GPUs. Getting quite a bit of development. It's, it's yeah, it really is stunning performance. It's got some cool stuff like it, your key value cache, so your context, your in memory, your working memory. It can on the fly quantize that, and it can also cache it very, very effectively to the point where you can actually use about 50% less VRAM or RAM by 
with its quantization enabled with no noticeable or discernible loss, which is really neat. But yeah, GPU only. Mistral RS is definitely the one to watch. Again, it's written in Rust, so it must be cool. That's the standard thing you've got to say when something's written in Rust. Or maybe just say it's written in Rust, so it takes ages to build. I don't know. I feel like that's that's more my sort of take on it. But it's incredible performance. Really, really, really good performance. It's modular by its design. So it can handle, right now it's doing GGUFs, the same as Llama CPP, but it can do raw, safe tensors. GPTQ support is coming this week. And more inference servers in the back end are coming every day. It's just a small project from a couple of like good engineers. And it's got some really, really fancy features like any mode, which is where you can combine models of completely different families into one mixture of expert style model, like a mixtural model, and, and just do a small bit of training on a model router, and it will pick the best model for your situation at any given time, which is, it's really neat the way that works. And it does speculative decoding. So you can take a really, really big model, like a 70 or 110 billion parameter model. You can take a model of the same family that's just one billion parameters, like a tiny little thing, something you'd run on your Apple Watch. And you put that in front of the large model and with absolutely no quality loss, and I had to deep dive as to really believe that, but it, no quality loss whatsoever, you can increase the speed of your performance and your tokens like six times, four to six times. It's very, very impressive. It, it takes on my GPU server, it takes my 70 billion parameter model at quite high quant, from about three tokens, four tokens a second, right up to like 18, 20 tokens a second, quite easily without even, you know, no other optimizations. Very, very, very cool. And I was speaking to Eric, who's the manager of that. He's looking for collaborators. I put it in the room the other day. If you're good with Rust, Rust or have got like GPU kernel optimization and experience, hit them up. They're looking for people to help like push it forward as like the open source LLM model server. Text generation web UI is super, super popular, supports lots of different backends like Llama CPP, XLlama V2, all the other things, including Tensor RT, LLM, the nightmare that it is. Lots of advanced parameters, it's daunting for new users, so it's really for people that want to turn those dials and push the buttons and all that sort of stuff. And the UI is pretty clunky because it's a Gradio base, it's not, not fantastic. But if you want to tweak all the settings, that's a great go-to tool parameter tuning. And I realize I'm running out of time here, but yeah, if you drop off, that's fine. Just at a really high level, just for coding tasks, I find I've, the, the thing I've settled on at the moment, maybe I'll change my mind, is that I set a temperature to about 0.35 and top P um, to 0.9. So that, you know, top P, it discards anything below the top, you know, the anything below the top 10%, basically it'll discard and temperature is not like some people mention it, just randomness. It's sort of a, it's like how much uh, entropy is injected at the start of other algorithms that will result in unique tokens being added to the pool of predicted tokens. So yeah, setting that low for coding is really good and the top P relatively high for coding. There's some awesome tools out there that let you play around with different sampling parameters. This one on the right here, that's actually my fork of it, but the upstream is a cool project as well. My fork just adds in a couple of coding examples and I trained it on quite a recent model. You can pick from a pre-canned sentence because it takes a bit to compute the inference for it. And then you can just tweak all those little sliders and bars there. I'd love to do a live demo of that, but it's really easy to use. And you can kind of go, well, what would my, what would the next word be that it's going to give me if I set my temperature all the way up to very creative? and you get a nice little actively updating a list of the next next cab off the rank, if you will, for the token prescriptions. So that's really handy. Advanced stuff, I'm not gonna cover that in the talk. You can go and read it if you're interested. Likewise with performance tuning, there's lots of stuff you can do there. The problem that you have with a lot of performance tuning stuff is the information for all this is really scattered. So it takes a long time to kind of collect all that information, know what you should and shouldn't fiddle with, <clears throat> but I've added a bit of that in here in case anyone wants it in the pack. The other model server that's really common is said Llama V2. Lots of cool options. Olama Grid Search for testing your parameters. Really handy tool. 
So it is a GUI tool, which I didn't think I'd really end up using much, but I have used it quite a bit. You can select any number of models on your Olama server, and then any combination of prompts and uh, generation parameters, temperatures, penalties, and it will go off and it can be as concurrent as you like. It will run inference with all your parameters and all the different matrices and sort of that you've defined below. And then you can go and you do A-B testing against all the prompts. And cool thing is you can export that as JSON. So you can feed that into other tools, whether it's training or whatever. So yeah, it's quite a handy wee tool. <laughs> Model management, downloading models. Lots of people ask about this. If they're using Olama, you can just pull a model from the registry, pick the quant you want, and you just pull it just like you do with Docker. You can create them yourself. Hugging Face, their official CLI tool for downloading is really awkward. I think it was written by aliens because the parameter passing has to be in a special order. I thought we got past that with Unix back in the day. It has weird ideas of regexes and globbing. It, when it downloads files by default, it stores them in a, it renames them for a start to the SHA of the file, and it stores them in some global directory, a global cache directory, and then symlinks them. And it's a nightmare to handle. There are some flags that you can pass to it to like try and stop it from renaming. I've not found that reliable. Handy little tool again, HF Downloader, just some dude had the same sort of annoyance as me with that. And he just, it's just like a wrapper around it basically. And it just does sensible stuff. I added a flag to it, dash J, just download, because I got sick of passing it all the parameters. Really, really handy. Definitely a, a must use tool. VRAM calculators. So tying into like model parameter sizes and quants, can you actually run it? Another, tools I re another set of tools I recommend is looking at these VRAM calculators. You can basically put in any model that's on hugging face, your desired context size and your quantization, and it will tell you how much VRAM you're gonna use. Um, so like a, a really big one, as I said, is the size of the context you wanna load in, and if you're gonna do any parallelization for performance. And MOE, I mentioned a couple of times, but people probably see it around. Just one key thing to remember that a lot of people don't know, and I got caught out with it myself, is that mixed rib experts models are, it's a silly name, are a big model that is actually lots of small models inside with a model router, is the, the basic way of thinking about it. And based on what the prompt is that it gets, it'll route it to a smaller model within that model that is more um, capable of whatever it is. So say it's a general model and you ask it for, or say it's a coding model, you ask it for a Python code. Maybe one of the experts is better at Python, one of them's better at Golang, one of them rips at you for still using Java, whatever. You, it'll route those. The cool thing is the, the performance, like the inference performance, is only as expensive as the smaller models themselves. So they call it active parameters. So for example, 16 billion parameter MOE model there is just as an example. It's only gonna, it's actually gonna be as fast as a tiny little 2.4 billion parameter model, which is awesome. But what a lot of people don't tell you is that, hot take, is, is that the memory requirements are still as big as the full model. So you still, in this case, have to have enough memory to load a 16 billion or a 230, no one has that, but 236 billion parameter model into RAM. Now, <clears throat> shameless plug here, if you're working with Golama, you end up with a big mess of models and templates and you, you end up having to clean them up all the time because there's just models everywhere and you can't remember what you used last month that you don't need anymore and sorting by quant size and stuff just it's just not possible. I wrote a little tool called GoLama, very creative, that lets you handle that little TUI interface, super, super handy. It also lets you get all your Olama models and symlink them to LM Studio because that's what I used to use. And yeah, just does that with like one key press. It's full of bugs. Give me a hand with it. Oh, now I can take a breath. Oh, right. Yesterday I got asked, oh, that looks good. So where do I get started? <laughs> I was like, oh shit, okay. So one pager, if you just like, okay, I just want to run something, just tell me how to run something. Install Olama, open Olama, run Olama pull, you pick a model, but Llama 3, you know, and I, I always personally go for a Q6K quant if I can run it. And you can install a client. You can use Olama just by itself in the CLI, it's pretty basic. 
let's see, anything LM, Dan, you, uh, LM Studio, whatever, and you're away. Most of them come pre-configured for Olama out of the box, so there's really not much else to it other than, yeah, go solve the world's problems. There's a little cheat sheet for that for offline if you really want to know or want to tell your grandmother how to run Quinn 2. Finally, last couple of slides. What's my home setup? I always get asked for that. It looks like a nuclear reactor on the right hand side, but I was kind of concerned about power usage and stuff. When I built a server that, or my home server that's quite old, it's actually been built over years of upgrading things. It's got RTX 3090 and two A4000s in it. My power usage is actually really low. I haven't noticed it on my bill at all. Linux does a really good job of, you know, even reducing the PCI link speed to save power when it's idle. Olama does a really good job of unloading models that haven't been used for a given period of time. It's all configurable. It just kind of works. There's my stats if you ever want to look at them. And finally, the links you've seen throughout the deck are mostly compiled onto this one slide. That QR code will take you to the page for this talk. There's a bunch of authors on Hugging Face on the left under Models and Quants that I often check to see which models they've released. They're, they provide quite high quality models, which is good, or quantizations. And community-wise, this is something I didn't mention before, I found the best AI community, hands down across the board, regardless of whatever it is, is a subreddit called Local Llama. So our Local Llama, it's awesome. That's kind of where I get a lot of my news and information from and tooling to try out. And yeah, it's a pretty, pretty helpful community too if you have problems, so shout out to them. And thanks. So you got another meme. Thanks for sitting through an awfully long talk which ran longer than I expected, and uh, a couple of issues there. But, yeah.